Okay, so recording away here. Um, we last class uh, we were labeling the muscles of the head and neck. I just want to kind of go through some of the muscles and their actions. I won't go into too much detail, but I, I do think that it'll kind of um, help you folks out because this is an anatomy class, so you do need to understand um, how these muscles or what the functions of these muscles are. Okay, so in general. If a muscle's on the front of your neck, okay, it'll help to flex your neck forward. Okay? If the muscle's on the back of the neck, it'll help to extend the neck back. All right, so think of muscles on the front or the anterior portion, flex the neck. If the sternal, remember this guy, the sternocleidoid mastoid muscle. Okay? This is the muscle that originates right, on the sternum and the clavicle, and it inserts onto the mastoid process of the temporal bone. The origin is the, the, the portion of the muscle that's the more stationary area, and the insertion is going to be the more mobile area. So if you contract just your right sternocleidoid mastoid muscle, what you'll do is you'll look down to the ground, and then if I'm contracting my right one, I'll look to the left. And you can actually feel that muscle when you do that maneuver there. So we call that in the contraction of one muscle that's going to be unilateral. So the unilateral contraction. Okay, or the one I just showed you, the right uh, sternocleidoid mastoid muscle causes that lateral flexion. That's me bringing my head down. That's lateral flexion, right? But it also is going to lead me to rotate my head. So lateral flexion purely is leaning your head to the to one side or the other, okay? And then rotation is turning the head. So this does a combination of both. It causes me to rotate and laterally flex. I'm just going to approximate my mastoid process to my sternum. Okay? I'm just going to bring those two spots closer. And they both contract when we get that bilateral. That's when we see flexion of the neck. Okay? So that's what we're going to see for sternocleidoid mastoid. Um, we labeled these muscles before here, the scalene muscles. Right? They will work in concert with the sternocleidoid mastoid muscle to help to flex the neck. They'll also do lateral flexion in addition to flexing the neck when they're, both sides are contracting. But one of the things that I, that I like to point out is that it's a muscle of respiration. Okay? So when you have to deal right, with respiration, you have to deal with the movement of the ribs. Normal respiration, like what we're doing now, the ribs move up and out light when you take a breath in. And then when you exhale, they drop down, like a bucket handle. When you lift the bucket handle up, okay, so it moves up with the bucket handle when you inhale, and then when you exhale, everything drops back down. There's going to be times when you have to force all right, a, a, a breath in. Okay? So that forced inhalation might need a little bit of extra help. We see that quite commonly in people that have COPD, emphysema, um, not so much in asthma. Okay? But what happens is first and second ribs, all right, that's where the scalings will attach onto, all right, during that forced inhalation, you need a little bit more of a lift there. These muscles help with that, okay? All right, so here you can see, here's the sternocleidoid mastoid muscle right here. And then we've got our scaling muscles here on the side, okay? This is a really nice picture of the sternocleidoid mastoid muscle because it actually shows you both points of origin. There's the sternal origin, and then here is the clavicular origin. Okay. Well, actually, I'm sorry, folks. I should zoom in. That makes a little bit easier. Okay. Here you can see right, this portion of the sternocleidoid mastoid muscle, and then this portion right here. And then right behind it, and it's tough to see on this drawing, we can see our scaling muscles. Okay, we'll have the anterior, middle, and posterior. And they'll attach on the first and second ribs to help to elevate those ribs. All right, muscles on the back of the neck, like I said, they help to extend the neck. All right, so when you're looking up towards the ceiling, all right, that's the hyperextension, but it's the same thing. I mean, it's not the same thing, but it's similar movement. You're extending. That's a form of extension there, okay? So the first muscle, which is the most superficial of all the muscles, all right, is the trapezius muscle, okay? Primarily neck extensor, 
right? But because it does attach from the head down to the shoulder girdle there, the pectoral girdle here, it helps to also act as a stabilizing muscle. It'll stabilize the pectoral girdle so other muscles that, that attach onto that, right, can do their actions. Okay? So, perfect example, right, when we see the upper trapezius muscle fibers engage, that's when you shrug your shoulders up and down, right? Elevation and depression there, right? But trapezius, the upper fibers are mainly responsible for elevation. It will also act in extension when you bring your arm, well, abduction and extension when you pull your arm back, right? Trapezius muscle, the middle fibers help you do that, right? And then the inferior fibers help to bring your arm back from the elevated position in this direction here. Um, the only muscle that you need to know out of all these guys is the splenius capitis muscle. Point being is we saw that on either side of the neck there. Okay, and So when we contract those muscles bilaterally, it causes extension. But when you contract, all right, or what we call ipsilateral contraction, only one side, you're going to turn your head to the ipsilateral side, which means same side. If I contract the right splenius capital, cap, excuse me, splenius capitis muscle, I'm going to look to the right. Okay? It helps with that. But when I contract both sides, I'll go into extension. Okay? I'll look up. Okay. Um, suboccipital muscles, again, these aren't muscles that you need to know for um, uh, identification. They are a, a, a good muscle to a good group of muscles to know because a lot of these muscles right, you will see having issues much more frequently now with the invention of well I shouldn't say now computers have been around for a while but specifically cell phones smartphones because people just 10 degrees of looking down you're engaging these muscles so these muscles are going to attach on to your upper cervical vertebrae onto the base of your skull right. Again, I won't get into these because you don't really have to know those and you wouldn't even know what, which ones I'm talking about. But a lot of these uh, play a role too. If they get too tight, they can impinge on nerves and cause cervical headaches. Okay. Gonna, there's a good possibility that your, your suboccipital muscles are quite tight. You know, um, a lot of my patients, if they do computer work, will sit down for six to eight hours a day. Especially now with the pandemic, almost I won't say everybody, but many people are working from home on a computer, and their work site is garbage. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I mean, and, and it depends on, and like I said, just 10 degrees of looking down, you are engaging those muscles, you're stretching those muscles, and so the muscles respond to that stretch, and they'll start to contract. And if they do it for long enough, then they're like, oh, well, this is what I'm normally supposed. To. So that becomes their normal. All right, uh, uh, tonicity or tone, so they're tight. So you know, just like with anything, you exercise muscles, they hypertrophy, they get bigger, and they'll push on stuff. Well, there's tons of nerves in that area, and most likely, you know, those headaches that you're getting are because those muscles are really tight. I tell folks, go get a good massage, but get maybe a couple. You might need, it might take a couple visits to really break those muscles apart, not like, harmful wise, but to get them to break down a little bit. So here you can see them, okay? On our deep dissection side, here are all these suboccipital muscles. Here's the atlas, and then you got C2 down here also. But C1 and C2, these muscles will attach, right? C1 to C2, or they might attach from C1 on to the base of your, your skull here. Point being is there's tons, you don't see in this picture here, there's a lot of nerves that are up in this area here. These muscles become hypertrophied, irritated, they, they squish on or they push on those nerves, and it causes a lot of those symptoms there. All right. Here's your splenius capitis muscle. That's why when you contract this muscle, you'll look to the same side. Okay, when we shorten it down here. All right, and then um, what was one other one? Oh. All right, erector spinae muscles. These muscles, all right, their main purpose, okay, is in the name, erector. Right? They are going to keep your spine upright. So they're mainly for posture. So when you're sitting there, you're engaging those muscles right now. When you're standing, you're engaging those muscles. When you drop something and you go to bend over to pick it up and you go to straighten back up, you're using those muscles. Okay? So 
Their job is mainly for upright posture, okay? But when you go and straighten up, when you extend the vertebral column, all right, that has to be both sides, both the left and the right erector spine, they have to actually engage. All right, when you do side bend, when you lean to the left, all right, that is just the one side, that lateral flexion, all right, you're going to move to that side. We call that ipsilateral lateral flexion, which means same side. Contralateral means opposite side, okay? We used to call this the I love spaghetti muscles. I for iliocostalis, all right, longissimus, love, then uh, spinalis is going to be spaghetti. I love spaghetti. Basically, what this is saying is this is the, the there's director spinae are a muscle group, but they're found in just different regions, okay, of your spine. Some up in the cervical area, some in the thoracic, some in the lumbar, okay? So we call those the I love spaghetti muscles. All right. Um, this one right here, you don't have to worry about the transversal spinalis muscles. My for identification, but I do want to talk about quadratus lumborum, another muscle group that I love. I, we name this muscle group after the shape of the muscle, right? Quadrilateral, because it, it looks like a rectangle, right? And then we also name it to where it's located, the lumbar spine. And we'll talk about this muscle today, right? So this is another muscle when it's a, you're using it right now as you're sitting up. I should be using mine a little bit better. When you're sitting up, right? You're engaging that muscle. Same thing when you're standing up. If I bend over, right, I'll contract both my left and right quad, uh, quadratus lumborum to help me straighten back up. If I do a side bend, I'm, I'm contracting left quadratus lumborum muscle. If I lean to the left, if I lean to the right, then I'm contracting the right quadratus lumborum. All right, that's what we're talking about here. Laterally flexes, all right, when it's unilaterally contracted. Right? So you'll see it in the lumbar spine. That's why we call it lumborum. Mm, here you go. All right, here's your I love spaghetti muscle group. All right, your erector spinae muscles. All right, you only have to know it as erector spinae. But they're the deepest muscle group. Okay, they lay right on top of the spine and the ribs. Right? And in fact, I right, longissimus, uh, not the longissimus, the iliocostalis group. And that's one of the reasons why we call it iliocostalis because it inserts onto some of the uh, ribs here, okay, that's going to be the most lateral group, and then the closest group to the spine, that's why we call it the spinalis group, and then in between, the longissimus group goes all the way up, that travels all the way up to the neck, okay, we can't see it here, but it goes all the way up, <clears throat> okay, we actually, well, I'm not going to get into that, down here is our quadrat quadratus lumborum, okay, again, it attaches, uh, it's found in the lumbar region, Attaches on to rib 12, extends down here, right, on to the iliac crest of your ilium, okay, and it also attaches on to the transverse processes, all right, of the uh, of the spine here, the lum of the lumbar spines. Again, you don't need to know this, but I just like to point this out to folks. This muscle group right here, multipedis. Okay, these are these small little finger-like muscles that you can see here, all right, and they attach one vertebrae to the next, to the next, to the next. What a lot of people don't know is multifidus is a muscle that is usually, I would say, the culprit in low back pain or back pain 50% of the time. If it's a muscle origin of your pain, it's multifidus that's involved, right? It might not be the only muscle involved, but it's involved, right? And it's just because it is... Uh, I won't say quite easily. Hold on one second. Where'd that come from? All right. Anyways, it's quite it's it's easily injured. All right. Um, I'm gonna stop for right now. I just wanted to go over. It's like a little lesson I'll throw out there at you, and we'll do some labeling here. I don't want to overwhelm you. Um, because muscles of respiration are fun, but we haven't really talked about some of those muscles. So let's do some labeling here. All right, muscles of the torso. Go ahead and bust out your album, your atlas, I should say. Okay. Okay. 
So, some of the muscles that we talk about today we'll see in, in our labeling uh, exercise today. Right. So, this is not a muscle, by the way. The linea alba is not a muscle. It's an anatomical structure, okay? And it's actually going to be found at the midline. So, if you drop a line, a plumb line, right down from the xiphoid process all the way down to the pubic symphysis, that line will go right down the linea alba, okay? Ladies, if any of you have ever been pregnant, all right, you may have noticed during pregnancy that this area became darker. They call that a linea nigrans, and it's only because the melanocytes, for whatever reason, become much more active uh, during a certain part of the pregnancy. I cannot remember if it was second trimester or third trimester, um, in which you'll get um, melanin uh, deposits. It'll be a dark line right along the linea alba. We'll see that in pregnant mommies. All right. Next slide shows us, move this over. That's the rectus abdominis muscle. That's the six pack muscle. Okay. So we talked about this muscle before when we were talking about parallel muscle fibers. Remember the fascicles here, striations are parallel, right? which provides this muscle with a high amount of endurance, but it's just not going to be terribly strong. I, I never thought it was strong enough when I had to take my PE test in gym class for push-ups. always seemed like I fatigued really fast. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to cut the front of you off, and we're going to flip it over, and we're going to look at the inside here. The muscle, abbrevi oh, muscle abbreviation is just M period. And period. You got it. So here's the rectus abdominis muscle on the inside. Okay, you can see these fibers are parallel running up and down. Okay, now when we flip our model back over and look at it from the anterior portion, okay, you see these white lines in between the muscle bellies. Those are called tendinous intersections. And the tendinous intersections obviously are going to be the tendinous attachments for this muscle, right? Um, 2020, so close to, I would say, 17, 18 years ago, there was a theory floating around, right, that these tendinous intersections were actually rudimentary ribs. So when we were developing, somewhere in our development, all right, whether you believe in evolution or creationism, somewhere in that development there, it was believed that these tendinous intersections used to be ribs. And uh, over time, they changed into these tendinous intersections. But that was a theory. And apparently, has anyone ever heard of that theory? Okay, so I should tell you. Apparently, it was not a very popular theory because it hasn't gone anywhere, all right? But that's when I heard about it, and I read some stuff on it, but I haven't found, heard anybody talking about it lately. So that's what happens to theories that aren't very popular. They just go away. All right, so now we're looking here at our external oblique muscle, okay? Again, when we're looking at the title for, or the, the name for this. External is going to be the, because this muscle is the most superficial of the oblique muscles. And we're talking about an oblique. Remember the oblique plane? It goes down at an angle, okay? And that's what we see here, okay? So the external oblique, and I tell folks, the external oblique is like putting your hands in your front pockets, all right? As your fingers, they go down and in, okay? The muscle fibers for the external oblique, they go down and in, okay? So it's like putting your hands in your front pockets, right? So it goes inferior medially. All right, the next muscle on the deeper side is the external, oops, excuse me, is the internal oblique. Got over for you. And now these fibers pretty much go up and in. Oops. All right, so that's the internal oblique. 
So the external oblique, the internal oblique, the rectus abdominis, these muscles help, all right, with you hear people talking about, I got to work out my core. That's what they're talking about. Okay, there's one other muscle here that I do want to talk about, and that's the transversus abdominis muscle. Okay, so these muscle fibers go from side to side, right across like that. Okay, so if you see muscle fibers, but yet there's ribs present, then you're not looking at the transversus abdominis. Okay, there are no ribs in the abdominal region. So transversus abdominis is going to have its muscle fibers going from side to side, but there's not going to be any ribs in the proximity of that. And again, transversus abdominis is another uh, uh, core muscle that you may have heard about. Okay, let's talk about this one right here. So as major. So as major all right, is a special muscle because it's its own individual muscle inside the uh, abdominal and pelvic cavity. But what's going to happen is it's going to leave the abdominal and pelvic cavity on its way out. It's going to fuse with another muscle and then it's going to have another name. All right? So right here, okay, it is called the psoas major muscle. It attaches onto parts of your lumbar spine here. All right, I'm going to show you another uh, model of the same muscle. I don't know what page this is on. Is it 44, 38, 33? Couldn't tell you. What page did you guys? 44, all right. So here you can see it, it's this whole thing right here. Now, so as major, you see the term major there, where it also has a minor, but you don't need to know the minor for identification purposes. There is a minor present, and that's this one right here. It sits right on top of it, okay? But just, for, just to know, just consider this whole thing. That's page 44, 44. All right, so that's so as major. All right, quadratus lumborum. We just talked about that. Okay, this you can see it a little bit better. Here it is over here on this side. All right. It's it's cut off by so as major on that one side there. Okay, but that's quadratus lumborum. We're already familiar with what it does. It helps to keep the spine upright and the low back especially. Okay, straightens your back up when you bend over. If you engage one of them, you'll lean to that side. Okay? That's the quadratus lumborum muscle. If you break it down and look at some of these terms for these anatomical you know, uh, um, terms that you need to know, um, it makes it a little bit easier. You know what I mean? Like this muscle here is in the lumbar region of the spine. Okay? It's square shaped, so it's quadratus lumborum. Um, folks have a tendency to have a little bit more difficulty with muscles than they do with bones. It could be different. You know, what was the spelling of the other? I don't know what you mean by the other. Which one? This one here? Oh, as major? So as, there you go. <clears throat> okay, well that's good. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just saying, several people do experience a little bit more difficulty when they're dealing with the muscles. There you go. Yeah, it could be helpful. Like this one here, iliacus. I feel like that's an easy one because iliacus. Remember when we were labeling the ilium, you had the iliac fossa smooth area of the anterior portion of the ilium. So iliacus sits there in the fossa and it's going to be the muscle that fuses right with psoas major and it's going to form a muscle down here but we'll have to wait on that one. Okay. 
We'll wait on that one when we do the appendicular skeleton. But it does fuse with psoas major to become the strongest hip flexor in the body. Okay. Anticipation. Mm. Okay. Going back to this is page 44. All right. You can see iliacus on this model here. It's also over here. Here you got iliacus on both sides here. Just keep in mind, iliacus sits right there in the iliac fossa. <clears throat> okay, so moving on now to the back. One of my favorite areas, We're right back here. All right, we just saw this, rector spinae muscle, right? Or I love spaghetti muscles. Now here you can see it, it's nice and deep sits right on the ribs and right against the spine. So here's uh, the erector spinae muscle. Here it is again down here, okay? I don't know if we can see it. Well, not in this model. You might be able to see it up top, okay? So here, a little bit down here, okay? So erector spinae, postural muscle. Keeps your spine upright. You bend over and you go to straighten up. It's doing a lot of the straightening. And then if you lean, from side to side, if I lean to the left, I'll engage the uh, erector spinae on this side. If I lean to the right, I'll engage the erector spinae on this side. Okay. All right, that's erector spinae. Here's trapezius. Right. This is the one that has a lot of different functions, and it looks like a diamond. Okay. So it goes all the way from the base of the skull out to the shoulder, and then all the way down to T12. Okay. So you can see how it has a lot of different types of movement because you can see the directions of these muscle fascicles are in all these different positions here. Okay. And how it also influences the movement of the pectoral girdle. Because remember, the pectoral girdle is the scapula and the clavicle. And so it inserts and it attaches onto both of those. So it influences the movement of the pectoral girdle. And in several cases, like I said, when you start to abduct, abduct your shoulder out away from your body, the first 15 degrees of that is done by supraspinatus. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So the first 15 degrees is supraspinatus. As you're doing that, okay, your scapula and the clavicle go anchor. Okay, they get they become an anchoring point. All right, and so and the trapezius helps to do that as you move your arm out and away. Okay. Eventually, when I get to here, I start to engage deltoid. We'll talk about deltoid. And then when I get way up here, I can't do it like I used to be able to. But when you get way up here and you try to bring your arm above your head, that's when the trapezius muscle takes over. Okay? So it has several different functions, but part of it is to manipulate the pectoral girdle movement there. All right, there's trapezius. Okay, Here you can see the latissimus dorsi muscle. Don't say this or write this as an answer, but it's commonly known as the lats, okay? But this muscle is very well developed, all right, in people that do a lot of pull-ups, people that do the butterfly stroke, swimmers, um, oh, rowers, people on the rowing team, okay? It has a lot to do with that rowing motion, just pulling things into your body, okay? That's going to be the latissimus dorsi muscle. All right, next, deltoid muscle. This muscle here, right, um, aside from offering the ability to abduct or abduct your shoulder, it also gives your shoulder that rounded contour appearance to it, okay? So this was that example of the, of the pennate muscles that we saw, the multi-pennate muscle, remember? where you have that one common tendon and then it gives off these tiny little tendons, okay? And then you've got the feather-like configuration on each side, the muscle fascicles would come off, All right? Well, that's the deltoid muscle. It is a multi-pennate um, muscle. So it's great that it has that because it has multi-directional movements, okay? So we can do abduction straight out. It can do abduction and flexion. It can do abduction and extension, okay? So it has the ability to move, all right, in several different directions now. All right, here's the anterior uh, portion of deltoid you can see on the front here. All 
right? And then we can see it here on the side. Now, this is probably where all the extremities are. What page is that? 45, 46? 36. 36. That was way off. Okay. So here's the whole thing right here. That's a deltoid. All right, so those are the three different um, uh, views that you can see it from. All right, now let's not forget. Remember what I was talking to you folks last week about the major and the minor? Remember zygomaticus major, zygomaticus minor? What was the rule? Do you guys remember the rule about minor and major? All right, minor is above the major. It's always above the major. Right? So here we were seeing rhomboid major okay and that's going to be this muscle right in here and it attaches onto right the medial border of the scapula and then onto the upper um, spinous processes here of the thoracic spine okay it's going to be uh, t3 t4 down to like t6 okay but it you can see now there's this little smaller muscle right above it, okay? And that's going to be rhomboid minor. So the major's above the minor. Now, if you notice, too, okay, trapezius is on the right side. This is our superficial dissection side. So when we peel trapezius away, rhomboid major and minor will be below that. So they're going to be deep to trapezius. You want to know that, too, right? Rhomboid minor right here. Okay, so the minor, this follows the rule. The minor is above the major, okay? Does anybody remember what this muscle is right here? Splenius capitis. Does anyone know what this muscle is right here that's attaching here under the corner of the scapula right here? It helps to elevate the scapula. Hmm? Elevator scapulae. Yep, levator scapulae. That's right. Levator scapulae. Good job. What's this muscle here? Yep, erector spinae. Good, 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 good. And then what's this one here? Latissimus dorsi. And then what's this muscle here? Deltoid. Good. good, good, good. All right. Moving on. All right. So here's another major muscle so it lasts stop it don't say that <laughs> all right um the terra's major muscle is this one here that i'm kind of outlining as best as i can all right that's the terra's major muscle so keeping in line with minor above the major okay we're going to see that um, I don't know if I have it in this slideshow or another one. Here's the teres major again. You're going to see it three different ways. Okay, I got another one for you. All right, and then flip it over. Here it is on the inside. Right, so this view here, if, you, if you're not sure what this view is, look over on this side. This is the inside of the arm. Okay, so that's Terra's um, major right there. On the previous view, I'll come back. Right, this is on the uh, lateral or the outside of the arm. Okay, it's back here. All we're doing is we're just flipping the model over, so you can see the inside. Okay, so then you've got this muscle here called serratus posterior muscle, and we call it, you know what serratus means, right? You ever use a serrated knife to cut your steak? Okay, it's jagged. It looks like this, kind of, okay? So this, is, this muscle, it has a serrated, and you can kind of see the serrated portions to it right over here where it's attaching onto the ribs. Right, it creates kind of like a serrated edging here. Okay. 
So that's serratus posterior, obviously, because it's on the back side. We do have a serrated anterior. You can see it just a little bit right here. Serratus anterior. Yeah, cool looking muscle. Yep, yep, yep. Well, the serratus anterior muscle is a muscle that's innervated by what they call the long thoracic nerve. And I bring that up only because the long thoracic nerve sits in your axilla, your armpit. And if people, and it's more common in women um, because women are more prone, obviously, to breast cancer, when they go in there and they have to remove some of the lymph nodes if they do any surgery in, in the axilla, sometimes they can nick the long thoracic nerve and then they can paralyze this muscle here. The main job of the serratus anterior muscle is to keep your shoulder blades flat on your back, okay? So um, if that nerve becomes severed, right, the, the, the shoulder blades will just do this, pop off the back. Not literally pop completely off, but they won't lay flush against the back. They just come off a little bit. You can also test that not necessarily because of the nerve damage, but if people have weak serratus anterior muscles, you ask them to do a push-up. If you see their shoulder blades really kind of, you know, pointing off the back, then you know that that muscle is pretty weak. Okay? There could be a number of things. You can here's one view of it. We'll see it in a different view. All right. All right. So now we're doing an internal view. Okay. We're looking inside of you. So we saw the. The transversus abdominis, remember what I said, if you don't see ribs, it's transversus abdominis. If you see ribs, it's something else. Well, here is that something else, okay? These muscle fibers go transversely across, but again, right, you're going to see ribs involved. That's going to be the transversus paresis. okay, transversus thoracis. All right, go in here to the chest. We got our pectoralis muscle here. Okay, you've got two of them, a pectoralis major and a pectoralis minor. But for our class, you don't need to know about pectoralis minor. All right, pectoralis major muscle is that muscle that gives you that defined chest. All right, this is an example. Remember of one of our muscle fascicle um, organizations. This is the what, the convergent one. Remember, you got all these muscle fibers coming from just different directions, but they all converge right onto that single tendon here. Right? That's the pectoralis major muscle. All right, now coming over, let me move this over a little bit. Here's serratus anterior. This is the one I was telling you about. And again, we call it serratus anterior because where these muscles are inserting onto the ribs, it gives it that serrated kind of appearance. Okay? Right. Unfortunately, you don't have this other view, but what we're going to do is we're going to just take this model and we're going to rotate it 45 degrees closer to us. You can get a better view of the serratus anterior here. Okay. Don't bother looking for this. This isn't in your lab book. Okay. That is serratus anterior. You just saw it at a much different angle. Okay, so we have muscles in between our ribs here. We call those intercostal muscles. And some of those muscles are involved with our respiration, our breathing. So we're going to talk about the first type here. These are the external intercostal muscles. Now, it's very difficult to see because of the, the light here right, on our model. But these fibers are going down and in, much like right, external oblique. Okay, So it's like putting your hands in your pockets. Those are your external intercostal muscles, okay? And also because they're more external. Those muscle fibers move 
down and in, or what we call um, medial, medial inferiorly, or inferior medially, down and in. Okay? That's the external intercostals. You can see, again, we're just rotating our model a little bit. Okay? External intercostals. All right, now we can see closer to the sternum the internal intercostals. And so these muscle fibers are going, all right, up and in. Okay, the external goes down and in. The internal intercostal muscles go up and in. All right, then we got our diaphragm, okay, before we already labeled the diaphragm, but now we're going to learn about the different parts to the diaphragm. So, simple. If the arrow's pointing to the red, that's a muscle, okay? I'm pretty confident that you will know that there is a muscle on this test coming up, all right, for lab test three, that if it's pointing to a red structure, you're going to be pretty close to being correct. You say it's a muscle. Okay, this is the muscular portion of the diaphragm, and the muscular portion of the diaphragm then attaches on to what we call the central tendon. Right, that's this whitish structure here. And if you notice, there are well two complete holes, and then then kind of like a circular structure over here, or an arch-like structure. So for our purposes, there's three holes right, that are affiliated with the diaphragm. We're going to talk about all three. First one, okay, that right there is going to be the cavill hiatus. Okay, that means, or I shouldn't say that means, but your inferior vena cava travels through that. Okay. So if you think about it, the diaphragm is kind of like the floor, it forms the floor of the thoracic cavity, where your lungs are, where your heart is, okay? And it's the diaphragm that divides the thoracic cavity from the abdominal pelvic cavity. Okay, but stuff still needs to get from the lower part of the body up into the chest, blood vessels for sure, right? So right, we see here this first hole, right? The inferior vena cava is going to travel through there. Well. That's deoxygenated blood. Okay? We have another structure for oxygenated blood. That's going to be the aorta, but there's one other thing that we're missing. Right? Below the diaphragm is your stomach. Okay? So we're going to see, all right, we're going to see the esophageal hiatus. That's where the esophagus, the tube that connects your throat, your pharynx, to, you already know this because we learned about it in the first lab test, right? That's going to be the hole that it travels through. Okay. So has anyone ever heard of a hiatal hernia? Hiatal hernia was when part of your stomach actually herniates through the diaphragm, right? And that's what it herniates up through the esophageal hiatus. Hence the term hiatal hernia. Okay, now you know. G.I. Joe, no one's half the battle. Okay, so keep that in mind. Okay. And then the last part, remember I said there's one other structure that's got to get through, and it travels right there, and that's going to be your aortic all right, hiatus there. Okay. And that's where the descending aorta is going to be passing through. What do you think? Not bad? Not too, too bad? Okay. All right. Um, I'm trying to think. Well, that's it for the for the, the labeling for today. Okay. So um, any questions at home? Can you go back one slide? I sure can. This one here. OK, 
Okay. Any questions from anybody at home? We're moving through this material at a pretty decent pace. Not too fast, but I'm saying we're doing we're doing all right. Um, all right. So I know that some of you might be uh, taking the test here. So um, we're going to call it quits here.